Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. After starting our podcast in 2020, we've covered over 100 unsolved missing persons cases. In some, like Kristen Smart and Nakia Eggleston, there have been huge updates that we've been able to do bonus episodes on. In others, there's been nothing but silence. Today, we're going to go back through our entire archive and talk about the cases that have been making progress since we last spoke about them. They may be smaller updates, but every inch forward is crucial. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to update you on the stories of Heather Teague, Morgan Nick, Brandy Myers, Sophia Juarez, Trudy Appleby, Deirdre Jacob, Oakley Carlson, Billy Smolinski, and Irene Gakwa. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. for joining us once again thank you hello welcome back i know right welcome back it's been a while but we are back this is going to be the last uh, season three episode you know we're just going to do a quick update and then next week we are going to begin season four that's lofty to say next week it is i've already started writing it we're fine um Season four is a local case to us, which I decided to make our season premiere because our very first episode was also a local case. And that's kind of the reason we started the show. So season four will be a local case. We will come back with that next week. But for now, what we have for you today is updates on several of our cases that we've covered. I'm looking forward to it. I want to hear it. I know it's good. And, you know, I kind of said this in the intro, but it's like when there's a huge update, we do a separate episode, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing happening in the other cases. There right. have been updates, just not enough to do a full thing on. And, you know, we've covered more recent cases. And in those cases, thankfully, there have been arrests. Um, and, you know, those trials are moving forward. So we want to just give you quick updates as to where those stand. So that's what we're doing this week. And um, yeah, and also, if you are on Patreon, you have seen a poll where we are asking you to vote on a book cover because we are going to be coming out with a book next month. I mean, don't say we. I know. I I love you. I'm sorry, but it is just me. It's it's totally fine. Yeah. This is this is your (laughs) this is your baby. So Take full credit and enjoy the spotlight. But yeah, absolutely. This is your book. Yeah. And it's going to be coming out. Um, I believe I said it for March 8th, the day before your birthday. Surprise. You remember that. All right. It took me a while. It's fine. Everybody on our Patreon will be getting a free copy. If you are a Kindle Unlimited member, you can also get it for free. But right now it is actually open for pre-orders so if you really want to buy one you can and we'll post the link in our show notes it's really unfortunate and sad content but the point of it much like the show is to bring light to lesser known missing persons cases yeah and i'm really excited because A lot of people still don't listen to podcasts. They don't really know what podcasts are, but, you know, everybody knows what a book is. So maybe like that'll just help get these stories out there a little bit more. Let's hope so. Yes. Look for that in March. And like I said, the pre-order link will be in the show notes. But as always, enough about us because who cares? Let's get to these updates because I love updates so much. 
We're going to start with one of our earlier episodes, The Bizarre Abduction of Heather Teague. Just to refresh your memories, Heather Teague was a 23-year-old resident of Henderson, Kentucky. On August 26, 1995, she was sunbathing on Newburgh Beach when a white male grabbed her by her hair and dragged her into the woods, never to be seen again. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really, really curious about these updates for this case. Yeah. Because we got a lot, a lot. We did. Of traffic with this. A lot of comments, a lot of messages. A lot of messages, yeah. A lot of warnings. Yes. Which was very bizarre. Yeah. And and this was this was the season finale of season one. Yeah. And we only did like twelve episodes or something. So this was like really, really early on. And for us to be getting like warnings of you shouldn't talk about this. Right. Yes. Yeah. Kind of things was a little weird. It was a little weird, but yeah. that definitely I mean, for me, I was like, Oh yeah, we'll bring it on. Let's Let's just keep digging into this then. Yeah. So she was abducted from a beach and the man who witnessed this was just chilling across the river, looking through his telescope like a normal day. Was it telescope or binoculars? Telescope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As you do. Yeah. You know. While while you're eating supper, apparently. (laughs) Yes, which was a whole other thing. It was a whole other thing, and I actually talk about that. But um, yeah, so this witness described the male as being approximately six feet tall, between 210 and 230 pounds, with brown hair and a bushy brown beard. The witness also said that the man appeared to be wearing a wig, and his face was covered with mosquito netting. So just like an overall creepy situation. I mean, yes, obviously he's dragging a woman by the hair, but like just a dude with like jorts, no shirt, mosquito netting over his face. It's it's not great. Right. And we I I remember this being a, a thing in the episode, like if he's wearing mosquito netting over his face, how was this person, the the witness able able yeah. to tell that it was a wig Mm -hmm. like none of this none of this made sense exactly and that's part of the conspiracy that this witness was actually a ci and he kind of made up this story because he actually knew it was happening but he had to give a quote-unquote plausible reason for having this knowledge So after a suspect sketch was released police received a tip that it looked like a local man named marty dill They checked vehicle records and Dill was found to own a red Bronco similar to the one that was seen near the location of Heather's abduction. On the evening of August 31st, 1995, Kentucky State Police arrived at Dill's trailer to execute a search warrant. A standoff ensued and shortly after 1 a.m. on September 1st, Dill died from a single gunshot wound to the head. The official story was suicide, but he was not alone in that trailer. His uncle, ex-Henderson police officer Ernie Green, was with him. And there's a lot to this story. It became our first two-parter. I definitely recommend listening to it if you haven't, um, even though I usually don't recommend listening to a lot of our earlier stuff because the sound quality is so bad. The, the case is just incredibly it's intriguing. amazing. And, and there's and, so much that we still haven't uncovered. No, not at all. I think there is a lot more to this. I think there's a lot of local corruption involved. Hence all of the warnings that Mm -hmm. we received. Yeah. No, there's definitely a lot more to this. And there are other missing people from around that time who could be related to this whole thing. Like it's, it's a big deal. Like this is one of the cases that I think is actually one of the biggest even though it doesn't necessarily seem like that, because I'm sure your average person has never heard the name Heather Teague before. No, but there's broader implications to this yeah. case. Yeah. yeah. But as you alluded to earlier, it's also the case that we probably receive the most messages on. And most of this messages, which we still get, I mean, honestly, we released this in 2020. And like to this day, I get messages telling me that dinner is actually lunch in Kentucky. Wait, dinner is lunch? I thought yeah. su- I thought supper was lunch. No, supper is dinner. Uh, okay. Because that was the thing. He was like, I was eating dinner and just looking through my telescope and it was 1 p.m. or something. 
Okay. So just to clear that up, dinner is lunch, supper is dinner. Heather's mom has been actively searching for answers in her daughter's case for nearly 30 years. Unfortunately, any new information has been scarce, but that may change. All right, lay it on me. In December of 2022, and we are recording this in February of 2023, so we're talking two months ago, maybe, it was announced that Kentucky State Police were going to run DNA tests on a few key pieces of evidence found at the scene. This evidence includes Heather's bathing suit bottoms and her towel. So what took them so long? I mean, Heather's mom has been fighting for 30 years because she's met resistance for 30 years. And it has been so tough to get local police, state police, the FBI to really look at this. And again, I'm going back to the corruption. And you can listen to our episodes to learn more about that. But yeah, I mean, I'm surprised, honestly, that it's happening at all. But I'm very grateful that it's happening because, you know, this happened in 1995. And DNA was definitely a thing. This is after the OJ trial. But it wasn't not nearly to the scientific level that it is today. No, exactly. So even if like, people knew about it back then, the testing was not what it is. And you needed way bigger samples. And hey, look, I'm happy that they still have all of the evidence. I know, because there are so many cases yes, that where, they don't. Yeah, I mean, there's so many cases where the evidence goes away, like, within five years. Yeah. So... It's been almost 30, and it's still there. So that's fantastic. And again, with the advances in DNA technology, it certainly seems possible that the offender could have shed skin cells or hair, if not body fluids, right? And I think in the 90s, like you had to have those bodily fluids, you had to have blood, you had to have semen, you had to have something like that in order to get a DNA profile. But now we have touch DNA, you can get it from a hair root, you know, things that you couldn't do before. Right, that and plus the the CODIS database is now 30 years ahead. Older, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's got a much bigger sample size. Yeah. You can test against. Right. Then I'm sure was in 1995 if CODIS was even in existence in 1995. It's definitely an exciting possibility that we could get some answers from this. Six-year-old Morgan Nick was abducted on June 9th, 1995 from a Little League game in Alma, Arkansas. There were many searches, but few clues in her case. The main clue was a red truck with a white cap seen at the baseball field, but the owner of that truck has never been found. All hope was not lost, however. In November of 2021, the FBI announced that it may be closer than ever to identifying Morgan's kidnapper. Billy Jack Lynx was born and raised in Crawford County, Arkansas. He was a World War II vet and moved around after. In the late 1970s, he moved to Van Buren, Arkansas. Two months after Morgan's abduction, Lynx attempted to abduct a young girl in Van Buren, which is only about eight miles from the baseball field from where Morgan was taken. Lynx died in prison in 2000, so there won't be any answers from him. The FBI, however, is looking for anyone who knew Lynx, whether it be from work, church, or any other social activity, to come forward with new information, no matter how insignificant it may seem. Their hope is that they can put the pieces together and finally find Morgan Nick. This update to me, even though it was short, is really important because we're talking about a case that's nearly 28 years old. And they have police, I mean, have searched different properties and things like that because of tips over the years. But to have a named person of interest like this so long after the case, to me, just proves the fact that no case is ever truly cold. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, get a fresh set of eyes on it, get new testing technology on it. You can solve these cases. With missing persons cases, though, it is tough because a lot of times there isn't any physical evidence. Right. But again, people die, like people grow, you know, they they have different 
circumstances and that might lead people to talk down the line. Right. So suspects may emerge who didn't emerge when everything first happened. That's why I feel like it's so important to talk about these cases because you never know when somebody is going to just say, oh, wait, maybe I do know something about this. Brandy Myers was 13 years old on May 26, 1992, when she went door to door in her neighborhood collecting donations for her school's readathon. Brandy was trying to get the most donations so she could win a trip to the zoo, but Brandy never returned to her Phoenix, Arizona home. The body of a young girl was found two days later, but it was not Brandy's. More bodies of young girls and women were found in and around a nearby canal, but it wasn't until 2015 that police made an arrest. Brian Patrick Miller was a fixture in the Phoenix comic book scene and was known as the zombie hunter, his popular cosplay character. Miller's ex-wife said that he had confessed to her that he murdered Brandy, but Miller has never been charged with any crimes related to her disappearance. Miller's trial for the murders of two women, Angela Brazo and Melanie Burness, dubbed the Phoenix Canal Murders, finally started in late 2022. It is currently ongoing. Miller's arrest came largely due to his DNA being found on the victims' bodies. As such, his defense team isn't trying to argue that he didn't commit the murders. Instead, they have had him plead not guilty by reason of insanity. In January of 2023, Dr. Bethany Brand testified in Miller's case. After having had several sessions with him, she told the court that he suffers from disassociative amnesia. This is a condition characterized by memory loss and gaps, especially surrounding traumatic events. Miller's lawyer argued that this dissociative amnesia combined with his autism spectrum disorder meant that Miller didn't know that it was wrong to murder those girls. Miller opted for a bench trial, which means he's in front of only a judge instead of a jury. The trial is expected to go into late February or early March before a verdict is reached. Well, there's really a whole lot to unpack there. Yeah. So he's on the spectrum. His lawyers are saying he's unfit to stand trial? No. So his lawyers are saying that between him being on the spectrum and suffering from disassociative amnesia, he did not really remember committing the crimes and didn't know that it was wrong. I'll be curious as to how that pans out. Yeah, and we'll see. Now, the difficult part of this is that he's not facing trial for Brandy's murder, despite allegedly having confessed it to his ex-wife. From what her sister said, it's basically because the DA said they don't have enough proof because it's really just the word of his ex-wife. They don't have any physical evidence. And they do have physical evidence in these cases. And basically, you know, it's two murders. If he's convicted, he's going away. He's not going to go away more for a third. And that makes sense from a legal standpoint, but it doesn't help the family. You know, it doesn't help the family get closure, even though closure doesn't exist. He's not facing punishment. For that particular murder. Yes. And that's so awful. And I and I empathize, you know, with the family so much because yeah, it's good that this guy is caught. He's off the streets. He's not going to hurt anybody else. But your loved one, your family member is still not actively receiving justice. Right. And we don't even know if the families of the two women for whom he's being prosecuted will receive justice. Because again, like he might get off based on this. We don't know because the trial is still ongoing. Right. February 4th, 2003 was the night before Sophia Juarez's fifth birthday. Like any kid on their birthday eve, she was so excited. That evening, she was playing with her brother in her room. There are differing accounts of what happened next, but at some point, Sophia left the home and simply disappeared. Despite an extensive search and publicity, no trace was found of the little girl. 
When we released our episode on Sophia's case in June of 2021, there had just been a potential breakthrough. A social media personality in Mexico posted a video on TikTok under the username Aka y Allah. This guy went to the town plaza in Culiacan, Sinaloa. Culiacan is the largest city in Sinaloa in northwestern Mexico. Talking to people on video, he started interviewing a young woman. This woman said she was homeless, but then said she was kidnapped as a young child. Quote, the truth is, I don't know where I'm from, end quote. She said this in Spanish. She went on to say that she wanted her grandmother and her grandfather to come find her and that she didn't like birthdays. Remember, Sofia was abducted the day before her birthday. This woman looked remarkably like Sofia, so it caused a huge stir online. You're Mr. Face Guy. That's like your whole role on this show. And you looked at her and you're like, yeah, that. Yeah, no, 100%. It, yeah. Like, I- I'm convinced that's her. I know. But right? then, the pro- then the problem was is that, you know, she's a resident homeless person, so they couldn't find her again, right? Yes. So it was difficult to find her. So they managed to track down her family and her family is like, no, she's not kidnapped. She's our, you know, child, our granddaughter, whatever. But obviously, what else are you going to say? And so they couldn't take their word for it. So it did take a while to track her down. But they eventually did. She had gone through a rehab program and was out. And when they did track her down, she voluntarily gave a DNA sample. Unfortunately, the test came back and confirmed that she was not Sofia Juarez. Oh, I thought for sure that that was her. I know. Yeah, she looked so much like her, though similarities the birthday thing right. like all of the circumstances around it it just it just fit like a weird terrible movie i know and yeah i mean obviously we want those happy endings we wanted you know obviously this woman has not had the easiest life but she's still young yeah. you know so i don't know so she's not sophia juarez sophia remains missing and hopefully this woman is going to get the help that she needs and will be able to have a positive life. Trudy Appleby was only 11 years old when she went missing on August 21st, 1996. Her father, Dennis, left work before Trudy awoke, but when he returned home that afternoon for lunch, his daughter was gone. When he couldn't track her down, police initially classified her as a runaway despite her young age and no history of trouble. Once an investigation started, neighbors reported that about 30 minutes after her father left for work the morning of her disappearance, multiple witnesses saw Trudy. She was inside a car in her father's driveway with an adult male behind the wheel. Witnesses described the car as a silver or gray boxy four-door sedan similar to a Chevy celebrity. None of the witnesses got any part of the license plate number. And by all appearances, Trudy went with the man willingly. The man was described as being in his 20s with curly brown hair and wearing a baseball cap. But none of the neighbors was able to identify him. Dennis and the rest of Trudy's family searched tirelessly for her. And despite believing that they knew who was responsible for her disappearance, Trudy was never found. In 2017, ahead of the 21st anniversary of her disappearance, police finally released the name of a person of interest, William Ed Smith. Smith was a family friend of the Applebee's. Trudy's father, Dennis, didn't believe that Smith was the only person involved. In 2017, Dennis had given an interview to WQAD in which he named another person whom he felt was involved, David Whipple, Ed Smith's son-in-law. Dennis told the reporter, quote, he knows what happens to my daughter. I believe that in my heart, 100 percent, end quote. Interestingly, Whipple was eventually convicted of sexually assaulting a 10-year-old child in 1996, the same year Trudy went missing. Police officially named Whipple as a person of interest in 2020. At that time, a third man was also named Jameson Jamie Fisher. He was a friend of both Whipple and Smith. Fisher is a habitual offender, but unlike Whipple, none of his convictions were for sex crimes. 
Despite having three names, police did not have enough evidence to charge any of them. DNA tests were performed on a boat that had belonged to Ed Smith at the time of Trudy's disappearance, but it doesn't seem as though any evidence was recovered. Smith died in prison in 2014, and after we released our episode in 2021, David Whipple also died. As of this recording in early 2023, Jamie Fisher is the only person of interest still alive, and he is still not talking. Many of Trudy's family members have passed away over the years, but her father, Dennis, and her uncle, Ray, are still fighting every single day to get justice for Trudy. August 22, 2022 was the 26th anniversary of Trudy's disappearance. Her uncle, Ray, told the Quad City Times, quote, Trudy's great-grandmother, her mother, her grandparents, they all died not knowing. That's a kind of pain you can't even really describe. Knowing where Trudy is, putting her to rest became the most important thing in your life, end quote. Ray spends his time now not only looking for his niece, but volunteering with local missing person groups and assisting with searches. He says that the simple act of helping strangers helps with his heartache and pain. On July 28, 1998, Deidre Jacob was home for the summer. On that particular day, she was running her errands and visiting family. She was alone in the middle of an afternoon in the town she grew up in. But Deidre never made it back to her parents' home. Though she was last seen only about 350 feet away from their front door, her whereabouts have remained a mystery for nearly 25 years. Deirdre was one of several women who disappeared in what the press called Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. In 2018, the 20th anniversary of her disappearance, authorities named a person of interest in Deirdre's case, Larry Murphy. Larry Murphy was a name that had been bandied about in relation to the Vanishing Triangle for several years by that point. Murphy was a contractor who lived in Baldingloss in County Wicklow within the area of the Triangle. In 2001, Murphy was convicted of abducting, repeatedly raping, and attempting to murder a woman in the Wicklow Mountains in 2000. He was interrupted during the crime by a pair of hunters and was later apprehended. He served 10 years of a 15-year sentence and was released in 2010. In 2011, an ex-cellmate of Murphy's told police that Murphy had confessed to Deirdre's abduction and murder. Despite this, they found no other evidence implicating Murphy, so an arrest wasn't made. In 2020, Deirdre's case was turned over to the director of public prosecutions, who were gathering everything they needed to make an arrest. While the DPP said that they believed Murphy to be in London, witnesses reported that they saw him in Ireland at a Garda COVID checkpoint. The Irish Times reported that Murphy had female clothing, a mattress, and pillows in the back of his van. He was apparently homeless and living back in Ireland. In February of 2021, the DPP confirmed that they were still working on the case with a high-ranking official telling The Independent, quote, We haven't forgotten about Larry Murphy. The DPP has been considering a case against our chief suspect for exactly one year. No news is good news. The longer the Garda evidence is considered, the better a signal this is for investigators as all aspects of the case are being fully considered, end quote. Now, this is where we left our episode over a year ago. Many of the articles that came out around that time said that an arrest was imminent. So we put out that episode thinking like this is going to be outdated very quickly. So what happened? Not much. In July of 2022, as yet another horrible anniversary approached, an article in the Irish Times said that the DPP had considered the file from the 2021 investigation that we had talked about, but had decided the evidence gathered was not strong enough to charge Murphy. Really? Yeah. They were so confident. Like, literally, there were quotes saying, an arrest is imminent. Well, it's his MO. Yeah. 
It matches. I know. And then he was like found in 2020 with the lady's clothes in his van. Like, right. Yeah, absolutely. Everything fits. It does. But Gardy used modern technology to enhance CCTV images for around Newbridge County Kildare on the day Deidre went missing in 1998. And because that surveillance video was a big part of this case. Right. However, they did not provide any information that linked Murphy to the crime, meaning that they had all the surveillance video. They found Deidre on the surveillance video, but not Larry Murphy. And so I think because of that, because they didn't physically have him there, they declined to prosecute. I think what's really frustrating about this is Leah Croucher is a case who we covered that is very similar to this, where she, you know, left from her parents' house. She was in her small town of Milton Keynes, and she was seen on CCTV that day. And it was found that she was murdered by a man who similarly was not on any of the CCTV footage of her. Right. It's not that Larry Murphy not being found on the CCTV footage disproves anything. It just, as the DPP says, it just really isn't enough for them to try to bring charges. For now. For now, yeah. And of course, this is ongoing. I mean, the fact that, again, this case is nearly 25 years old. I mean, and there's still leads, there's still movement, that's a big deal. And and it's absolutely still active. This is not the end. It's just a, another frustrating setback. In November 2019, Oakley Carlson was just a month shy of her third birthday. But instead of celebrating with the family who had been taking care of her since she was seven months old, she was instead being returned to her biological parents. Oakley's foster parents, who wanted to adopt the little girl whom they thought of as their daughter, begged the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families to reconsider this decision because they didn't believe that Oakley would be safe. Two years later, their worst nightmare would come true. Oakley was reported missing, and no one has seen her since. When we aired our episode on Oakley's story in April of 2022, authorities didn't have enough evidence to charge her biological parents, Andrew Carlson and Jordan Bowers, with any crimes related to Oakley's disappearance. Instead, they hit them with charges related to neglecting their other children, abandonment of a dependent person in the second degree, and two counts of endangerment with a controlled substance. Andrew pled guilty to his charges and ended up spending about eight months in jail before being released on August 3rd, 2022. Though he was released, he wasn't out of the reach of the justice system. Carlson was supposed to return to court the following month to verify that he had obtained a chemical dependency evaluation within 45 days of his release. He did not show up to his September 12th hearing. His defense attorney told the judge that he had been unable to reach his client. The judge issued a bench warrant and set bail at $25,000. The warrant was rescinded shortly thereafter when a court received confirmation that Carlson was in a substance abuse treatment program in eastern Washington. He was given an extra week to file all of his information and a second review hearing was set for September 19th. While Carlson did submit his certificate from treatment, he failed to provide his evaluation and treatment plan. The judge at the hearing, Judge Catherine Svoboda, ordered Carlson to file the paperwork by 5 p.m. on September 29th and to appear back in her court on October 3rd. At his October 3rd hearing, Andrew Carlson was finally deemed to be in compliance, though he would remain under monitoring. He has still refused to answer any questions regarding Oakley's disappearance. Jordan Bowers received a longer sentence than her husband. While he was receiving treatment and going back and forth to these hearings, she remained in custody. It wasn't until January 15th, 2023 that she was released from jail on those charges. But she had even less of a taste of freedom than her husband. Just minutes after her release, Bowers was rearrested and charged with three counts of identity theft in the first degree and one count in the second degree. Got her. 
Yeah. And in our original episode on Oakley Carlson, we talked about how these arrests and charges were basically the Grays Harbor County Sheriff's Department's way of buying time. Yeah. They were trying to keep them in custody, trying to get them to talk while they built their case. Right. Unfortunately, Andrew Carlson was released before they were able to do that. Jordan Bowers was released, but they had an ace up their sleeve in the way of this identity theft charge. So she literally got released from jail and they're like, oh, JK, JK, Una Reverse, go back. And she did. The Grace Harbor Sheriff's Office told reporters that, quote, these charges stem from complaints from multiple victims who experienced fraudulent banking activity. After the investigation was completed, Jordan Bowers was identified as the primary suspect. At her January 23rd arraignment, Bowers pleaded not guilty to the charges. Her bail was set at $50,000. If convicted, she will face up to 15 years in prison and a fine of up to $30,000. Her trial is set to begin in March of 2023. Early on the morning of August 24th, 2004, Billy Smolinski put a ladder up against his ex-girlfriend Madeline's house and climbed up to her second floor window. According to Madeline, she let him in and they argued. He wanted to get back together, but she didn't, and he eventually left. At 3 p.m. that afternoon, Billy ate at a Burger King in Waterbury, Connecticut, and then returned home. He went to his neighbor's house, a man named Henley, to ask if he could watch his dog Harley for a few days. According to Henley, Billy told him that he was going up north to look at a car. Billy was never seen again. When the Smolensky family finally reported Billy missing, they weren't taken seriously. Billy was an adult, the police said. He'd show back up. He didn't, and Billy's family soon became convinced that Madeline knew more than she was letting on. A fight ensued, and Madeline sued Billy's mother and sister for defamation in 2011. Throughout it all, Billy's family never gave up looking for him. They were able to hire a private investigator, find DNA evidence, and with the help of Heather Teague's mother, introduce the 2009 federal legislation known as Billy's Law. The bill was officially called the Help Find the Missing Act, and Heather Teague's mother, Sarah, was one of its main proponents. The bill's goal was to authorize funding for NamUs and increase its accessibility. It also called for sharing information between NamUs and the NTIC, the FBI's crime database. Sarah told reporters, quote, There are thousands of families that could be able to bring their children home when these two organizations come together, end quote. Sarah and Janice Molinsky want what all families of missing adults want, for their loved ones' cases to be taken seriously by law enforcement and for agencies to have the proper tools to conduct these investigations. Billy's Law aimed to help with that. Connecticut Representative Chris Murphy introduced the bill to the House in 2011. It was not passed. The bill failed again in 2014. And when we aired this episode, like our big call to action was, you know, contact your representative, try to get this bill passed because this is such a softball. Like, who is against this? Yeah. Like, who? Who who would be opposed to this? Well, I don't know. But it took over a decade. But finally, in December of 2022... Billy's law was finally passed by both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Chris Murphy, who went from the House and is now a U.S. Senator, released the following statement, quote, This moment has been 15 years in the making, and I'm so proud that thanks to the Smolensky's persistence, Billy's law is headed for the president's desk to be signed into law. This legislation will ensure that the families facing the uncertainty and the heartache of a loved one's disappearance are no longer burdened by unnecessary obstacles in their search for answers and closure, end quote. So while we may not be any closer to finding Billy Smolinski, at least this case, along with Heather Teagues, has brought greater good to other families of missing people. I did this entire episode in 
reverse chronological order. So we went from oldest case to the newest cases. So now we're going to get to the most recent case that we covered that has updates. In 2019, Irene Gakwa left her home in Kenya to join her brothers and make a new life in the United States, Idaho to be specific. Irene quickly got a job and a boyfriend. She and her boyfriend, Nathan Heitman, met online. Irene's family wasn't too sure about him, but by the summer of 2021, she moved with him to the small town of Gillette, Wyoming. And by February of 2022, she was missing. According to Nathan, Irene packed her belongings into two trash bags and was picked up by someone in a dark SUV. Thankfully, authorities didn't buy his story and an investigation was quickly started. Police checked Irene's bank and credit card activity, which brought them to a local Walmart. There, Nathan was seen on surveillance video using Irene's credit card to buy a shovel, a pair of pants, and a pair of boots. Nathan was eventually arrested on charges of felony theft, two counts of crimes against intellectual property, and unlawful use of a credit card. He pleaded not guilty at his arraignment on May 31st, 2022. Since then, his trial has been pushed back multiple times. It was supposed to begin in February of 2023, but has been pushed back until April. Hyman's lawyers also said that he may request a change of venue given the high amount of local publicity Irene's case has generated. Nathan Heitman has yet to be charged with any crimes related directly to Irene's disappearance and still maintains that she left of her own free will. Volunteers still hold searches for Irene, but she has yet to be found. I set up Google alerts for the names of the missing people we cover in hopes of not missing any updates that may come. There are some cases we've talked about on the podcast with such huge updates that they've gotten their own follow-up episodes. Cases like Michael Vaughn and Akia Eggleston or Kristen Smart. But there are many other names that I search for and our episode on them from 2022 or 2021 or 2020 was the most recent result. Please keep sharing these cases. Please keep suggesting new ones. All of these people deserve to be found and they deserve to be remembered. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos on our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!